Within an event-driven architecture, you will encounter many types of events, and depending on who you ask, you might get a different answer. And for me, here are five types of events that I usually work with. There are the system events, which are typically related to changes to the infrastructure or execution environment of your system, such as the copious amount of events that AWS sends to the default event bridge bus, whenever an EC2 instance is started, stopped, or terminated, and so on. And then there are the telemetry events, such as page views, users logging in, and so on, the type of events that are typically aggregated as metrics and displayed on the dashboards. There are the data events, such as the DynamoDB events that you can capture in DynamoDB streams for whenever an item is inserted, updated, or removed from a table. But the most important events are the domain events, which are significant events within your business domain that represent a change in the state or some notable action. For instance, in our demo app, when a customer places an order, the order place event is a domain event. Domain events are internal to the bounded context of a service. They help maintain your business logic and trigger workflows within the same domain. And finally, there are the integration events, which are designed to communicate changes across different bounded contexts or systems. For example, after an order is placed, an inventory updated event might be published to synchronize inventory data between different systems. With microservices, you should generally prefer synchronizing data using integration events like this over making synchronous API calls between services, because synchronous communication between services can lead to increased coupling between these services, which contradicts the microservices architecture principle of developing independent, loosely coupled services and it increases the likelihood of a cascade failure when one of the services goes down, bringing all the other services that depend on it to become unavailable as well. So these are the five most common types of events, and the most important of which are the domain and integration events. So in this lesson, let's take a moment to appreciate and understand their differences. For starters, as we discussed already, domain events are there to drive domain-specific business logic, whereas integration events are there to help us maintain system-wide data consistency. Again, taking our demo app as example, the five events that we have modeled so far are all domain events and are used to drive the domain-specific logic related to processing a customer order. Some of these might be interesting to other systems, but some are not. It's not useful for other systems to know that you have notified the restaurant or the user of the order but the order placed and order fulfilled events will be useful for other services to keep a record of the orders in the system. For example, a service that issues promo codes would want to know when a customer has completed an order so we can send them a promo code to get a discount on their next order. It can use the integration events to build up a database of these orders. So when it needs to figure out which customers to send discount codes to, it can query its own database without needing to make calls to the order services API to get a list of the customers who have recently placed an order. This allows the two services to be loosely coupled and reduce the amount of load on the order service. And even if the order service is down, we can still send out those promo codes. And that's the primary use case for integration events to help us maintain system-wide data consistency. But there's also a difference in the timing of these two types of events. Domain events are published immediately after the domain event has happened because they are published and consumed at the source of the domain event by the service that owns the domain. Whereas integration events tend to be slightly delayed because you typically have to aggregate data from a number of sources to put together everything that someone else might need to know about the domain event. Which is why integration events also tend to be rich events simply because we don't know who's listening for this, so it's better to over-communicate. Whereas for domain events, they tend to be light events because they are shared within the domain, so we know exactly what we're going to need, seeing as we own the subscribers as well. So it's easy to pack just the right amount of information in these events. But wait, there is still a problem. As Eric Evans pointed out in his seminal book, Domain-Driven Design, 
The same entity can exist in different bounded contexts and have different meanings, attributes, and behaviors. So how can we prevent integration events from another domain from, say, clashing with our own domain events? If both domains have the concept of a customer but have it mean different things, and they both have a customer-created event, and in domain-driven design, context mapping is used to visualize and manage interaction between different bounded contexts within a complex system. And anti-corruption layers is a specific pattern within context mapping to help you prevent another bounded context design decisions, such as the names of its integration events, from affecting what we want to do within our own bounded context. So in the next lesson, let's talk about context mapping and the different patterns within that, and specifically when should we have an anti-corruption layer in our event-driven architecture. Okay, I'll see you in the next lesson. Hi, I hope you have enjoyed this video. And if you do, why not check out these other videos and learn more about serverless development?